Welcome inside the Parisi Palace, high above 3773 East Broadway. This is the Jake Feinberg Show. Comedy on Power Talk, thank you so much for making us part of your day today. And after 10 years on the radio and streaming worldwide and in a podcast form, about 2,000 interviews under my belt and my fourth book on the way, it's cats like my next guest to put me on my path um, to recognize that really the definition of success in this life is being unique, being singular, and cutting through the morass of what everybody else is trying to do in your profession. My guest is a drummer who became who played himself, and he obviously had his influences and his mentors, and but ultimately he cut through all the other drummers around him and be was able to develop his own individual sound and his own unique point of view as it related to the conversation on the bandstand and because at the end of the day when you move on to the next life when you leave the body and move on you don't take any of the material stuff you don't take any of the toys or the commodifications or the the didgeridoos, that stuff stays behind. But what you do leave behind is an indelible legacy um, for those seekers who come along now and in the future so that they understand how real music and new musical vocabulary is made. Jerry Grinelli, welcome back to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, hey man. Yo, you should do an interview with yourself, man. That would be cool. You've done 2,000 shows. <laughs> You're probably one of the more interesting ones. I'm telling Jerry. I, listen, Thank I've you. had a few. Ca- I'm. I, it's funny you mentioned that. I was sitting around the other day. I'm like, yeah. You know, I guess people just assume because I do a podcast that I wouldn't want to be interviewed. A couple of cats have interviewed me, and they've been more psychological. Oh, man. They're very hip. I, I wouldn't want to interview myself, but I mean, you know, like, um, yeah, truly, man, Grinelli, man. I we we did our first interview back in 2013, and uh, it was so right. it was so hey. like. Uh, I just wanted you to talk a little, Jerry, as early as you, uh, you know, as best as you can remember about, uh, you know, a time in your career when you finally surrendered to the music, got out of your own way, basically got out of your, the way of your ego and you became a conduit. You became a conduit for information coming through you from the heavens. Well, I think that that's, if, if you're fortunate enough, and I always come back, we've always talked about this, if you're fortunate enough to, um, which I was, to um, be around players who, who, who actually did that, you know what I mean, um, Miles, and that was a generation I was learning from directly. So, um, And their message was very clear to you, simple things like, you know, Problem is, man, you think you're still trying to think up what to play. Right. You don't think up what to play. You hear what to play. Right. And I, you know, like I was, I was trying to be hip, so I'd be like, "Oh yeah, man, yeah." I had no idea what they were talking about. You know, not a clue. <laughs> and I certainly wasn't willing. Certainly wasn't willing to give up all these uh, defenses of fear to, to hide my fear. You know. That, and admit that I really didn't know how to do it. That you, it happened. So it would happen one night, and then it wouldn't happen for a week. And I couldn't figure out why. You know, I'd smoke the same amount of dope, wear the same clothes, you know, all this stuff. <laughs> so the, the lineage, the older players were always pointing this out to you, you know, or you would play something and... And you'd think, oh, God, I'm just being so simple, you know. Uh, and somebody, one of them would go, yeah, man, you sound good. Oh, wow, you know? wow. And then you'd be like, oh, shit. <laughs> I, don't even know. I don't even know when I sound good, right. you know. Right. Uh, and so you, it's almost like you get so confused and it becomes so painful that you, give it up you're willing to give it up because you're tired of holding your head in your hands and crying you know i mean i'm talking literally hmm. at the table you know it's like i can't figure this out and 
and you just finally are willing to do what somebody tells you. You know, like, go, okay, I'll keep it simple. I won't. And it starts to dawn. It really does. It sounds like you know, satiric, but it's not. It's like it practically sounds to dawn because people start going, hey, man, you want to play. Rather than you having to wait or having to ask, you know. So that's what start for me, that's what started to do it. And this, this understanding that the whole point is to find your own voice. And that's a very, 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 very difficult journey. Yeah, that's painful. You know, and part, yeah. well, I, I mean, because. So you don't care what other people's voices are. You're just looking for yours. And that takes a long time to grow. Like, like when just, you know. just, just, just like Bob City. I don't know. Uh, I don't know if Dexter Gordon yeah. or De- I mean, like Dewey, like these cats. Like, um, no. you know, you're basically saying like you'd you'd be up there and maybe saying, well, I really I feel like a pressure to show that I I belong. So I'm playing. I'm 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 using a lot of language. And really, when I just play simply, oh, man, you know, I had to yeah. I could do, and I could do that. Yeah, right. This. But that's not what they 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 they, they oh. wanted you to play. They wanted you to just play a, something that felt good and very simple, right? And that was just sort of the Zen. Not real. Yeah, they didn't need it even to be simple. They needed it to be actually real. Re- well, okay, real. What is uh, what, real? Re- what is serving the song? What, real is, what does real mean? Real was a lot of has a lot of elements to it. I was I was sitting next to a, there's a great drummer who was in New York who kind of vanished in the ether, Jimmy Lovelace. And Dewey oh my and I, God, dude, is he still Jimmy. with us, dude? I hope so. God, Lovelace, um, dude, Gadsden bought a set of drums off him for seven bucks, dude, in Kansas City. I know. <laughs> I know. I love Lovelace, dude. Lovelace, and I'm yeah. I'm sitting there, and there's some drummer up there playing. Yeah. And and I turn to. I turned to Lovelace, who was had a beautiful sense of humor, and in an arrogant way, I say, "Oh man, I can play more with, with one hand, and that motherfucker can play with his whole body, you know, with everything." <laughs> and Jimmy, <laughs> Jimmy turns to me and he goes, "Yeah, man, but have you dug it? He's the one they're playing with, not you." Right, right. They asked them. The, they asked him to oh. play. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I went up there and then I played really simple. Just I just stole, you know, did the Philly Joe Joe thing. Boom, boom, whack, boom, 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 whack. Didn't get lost. Everybody was like, "Hey, man, you sound good, man. You've been shedding, huh?" You know. And it was because it was like I was actually serving the music rather than serving myself. Oh, wow. Rather than protecting myself. So, and then. You start to talk about that with people about you want to play with people who serve the music. They're there to be an instrument, to be developed, have all this great technique only at the service of the music. But see, we're not taught that way. So it's a hard way to come around, you know. But if you look at Tony, you know, I heard Tony when he was a kid. And he had, you could tell there was a voice there. But you hear Tony at the end, and there's a real voice. That's the voice that developed, you know. But uh, and, and I think people give you a shot because maybe they hear a hint of that voice. Or they say maybe this, this person, it could be possible for this one. So let's talk to him a little bit, you know. Uh, Jerry, I want to read you this. But it's a, it's yeah. a journey. Well, I want—I mean, this is a whole other component to it as it relates to once you become a servant of the music collectively, then it's about the conversation on the bandstand. This is what Gary Bartz said to me, and and I and this is a very Julian Priestery Grinnellian kind of thing, and so I just want to read it to you, and then you can just riff on it because yeah. it just relates to what we're talking about. Um. He said, uh, this is Gary Bartz, he said, when I worked with Max Roach, 
he would not allow you to have music on the bandstand. He'd say, there's no magic. Right. There's no magic when you have the music. We would rehearse in the morning and learn three or four songs. Then that night he calls them. We try to sneak the music out on the stage and he'd look over and say, no, no music on the bandstand. And that made it, made us learn it quicker. Right. What most people call classical music, I call that musical training. They have longer time, right. so they have the exercises, the etudes. They can teach you how to play, but they can't teach you what to play. The musicians of today no. are mostly playing what other people, this is really the important thing, what other people have already heard. Nobody can play like Dizzy. Mm -hmm. Even if you tried, you can't play like Dizzy because that's his hearing. You have to see what you yeah. hear. If you can't see what you hear, then you have a problem when somebody when somebody what somebody else hears. That's a problem. So what he's basically saying is that you guys came up basically as autodidacts. I mean, you learned to hear the music before you learned to read it. In today's world, the cats are learning to read before they're learning to hear. And as a result, we talked about this before, the homogenization of huge classical orchestras or jazz ensembles. You can't yeah. tell who it is. It's because they're not, nobody could hear like Dizzy, but Dizzy was hearing everything around him in his own way because he was hearing it before he ever read the music. And I just want you to riff on the idea of individual hearing, like maybe where your ears grew the most, you maybe, I don't know, maybe you did start to read music before you learned to hear it, but most of your generation, they'd hear something on the radio and they'd have to kind of internalize it. There were no rewind buttons. You learned everything by ear. So you could hear. Yeah, you had to go back yeah. and listen to the, Yeah. You listen to the record, you got the record. So then you learned the record. Right. You learned it by heart. Because that night, probably somebody was going to want to play that tune at Pop City, who had got the record before you. So they already knew the tune, you know. <laughs> right. But this, 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 this is really a great point, because if you right now there's so much technology available for people. And at some level, they're much more skilled than we ever were, you know, technically. But that this idea that... There's a separate set of rules. If you want to learn to be a spontaneous composer, which was what Dizzy Gillespie was, Charlie Parker was, all the great jazz artists are. Yep. We're like Mozart doing it live. Right. Right. Beethoven, man. You look at the bandstand, you go, oh, there's Mozart, Beethoven, <laughs> Mahler, all those guys. Oh, Mahler's playing piano in this band. I didn't know that. How far <laughs> out, you know? We are, we were, we are, I'm sorry, I'm not being arrogant, but all right. the, 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 the composers of our time, we learned, I don't need to know what I'm going to play. Now, if you want to live that credo, like Priester <laughs> and yeah. other people, yeah. you know, that's some scary stuff. Oh, dude, you know? I can't I even, it's the most, I mean, dude, honestly, that's, it, it, to me, I, it's so easy for me to sit behind the mic because that's exactly the only kind of musician that I get off on. It's got to be terrifying at first, but it's so the, the way to go. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, I want to get the last thing I want to do is know what I'm going to do. Right. You know? Right. I know I can do it. I'm, I'm you know, I've, I know the music is going to show up, but I don't need to know all that. That's the, well, wow, man, that's the terrifying, joyful part of making a piece with four other people, say. That's not a conversation. It's everybody saying, following, serving this piece that is being born in front of us. You see? In the moment, and in I the moment, in the moment expression, right? In the moment, honest yeah. Improvisation, so creation. I'm only playing what's needed. If I'm if I'm playing properly, I'm only needed. Mm. I'm not laying out so Feaster can talk. I got nothing written on my part, man. <laughs> you know, I'm going to come in, right? You know, and I'm going to listen. I'm listening, but I'm listening to the larger piece. I'm not listening to. The individual players. I am, but I'm not. 
You know what I mean? I'm looking at the larger view. And the larger view is what gives me the information and allows me to be, you know, know what's in the marble, as Michelangelo used to say. You just cut away the excess. So I don't need to know what I'm going to play. And if I know what I'm going to play, well, that's I've played it already. So, and, and uh, you know, as it relates to, I mean, that's, yeah, you know, go ahead. We know how to teach that now. That's the difference. We know how to talk about it. We know how to teach it. We know to, we know how to do it with taking people who don't even have musical skills, three notes on a ukulele, and you can build a whole piece of music around that person. Because we know how to teach it. Because human beings... We know now that that's the creative state. That's what human beings do all the time, every moment of our lives. We have no idea what we're going to talk about, really. You know, and so I think that's a real important point we're at. It may be a very um, point that's going to get us out of a lot of this mess we're in, you know, is that I mean, you know, the other crisis, it just, it seems to me like, I'm not sure, I mean, you guys were just having such a great time, and trying to sing for your supper, and trying to create legacy. Oh, yeah. I mean, but the point is that, I don't care if it was, you know, you can say what you want about Saul's aunts, but, you know, the guy, Orrin Keep News, Ralph Gleason, um, I'm just saying the guys that were in charge, the a, they were A&R guys, that were producing records. So it wasn't like bean counters producing records. These guys had an aesthetic and a love of art, or they for the, they loved what we have been talking about for the last 18 minutes. So that stuff got marketed. Yeah. That, that stuff got marketed. Now today, the cats who are making the decisions about what gets marketed are bean counters. They have no understanding of spiritual music. So that's, to me... In in terms of the player, there's a crisis. But in terms of the dissemination of the material, there's also a crisis. Because, I mean, you guys came up at a time when not only was there a record-based industry, but the people who were making a decision about what was going to get out there were freaks. They were music freaks. That was what was so amazing about it. Yeah, and they were doing against all odds, and they were still trying to make a buck. Exactly. Uh, they, they they had their filters and, you know, uh, Saul Zance and Max, uh, when they had Fantasy, me and Fred Marshall and Flip Nunez, Noel Jukes had this quartet. And so they said, you know, you guys are really out, but we'll give you a record, you know. I love it. And so we came in and um, we came and they said, but the lengths have to be so they can get played. So we came <laughs> in with this genius idea. We finished this. We brought in this finished thing, and we said, "Hey, man, it's perfect. It's a twenty-minute single." And they just said, "Get out of here! Just go away! No one will ever." And we're like, "Man, but it's a single. It's all you know what I mean." And they're like, "Just oh my god, you guys are in. It's impossible to even help you." <laughs> but you, the sh- you could only get it down to twenty minutes. You couldn't get like a four yeah. minute clip. I, I mean, you guys were really. No, no, no. Wait, I, tell me, please tell me somebody has some sort of acetate of that. I mean, I really want to hear that stuff, man. I think it must be. Actually, I have some of it here. Yeah. But I mean, and the point is that they they were like they were like Grinelli. Like, what is? You guys are freaks, but it wasn't like. I don't know, man. There was this component to the whole thing about commerce like that word commerce like we're, we're in this like insane time of of insanity and greed and like whatever the bottom line is and i just I, I i find it one reason that i just continue to stay on this path is just the the understanding that things are cyclical and the the hope and the belief that in some way shape or form Something will come back around. I mean, listen, Saul's Ants, like, it, even the way it was structured, Creedence Clearwater, down on the bayou, born, yeah. on the, born on the bayou, paid for Michael Howell records and Joe Henderson records. I mean, in, in, in today's world, Creedence would get all that money. 
and there'd be almost like a one percent trickle down to the other artists, just a couple of scraps. But I mean that it just yeah. the, the whole thing made there was a lot more of an allegiance to. And I just think Jerry, I think here's the bottom line. This is really what I want to ask you. When well, you it's so funny going out, to, yeah, I went out to Fantasy to to mix the the, the dance hall record with Bill and Robin, and I walked in and they were very very. I mean they were like. Oh, it's so good to have you come home after all these years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, dude, those guys, I'm like telling you, man, like, dude, I mean, they are carrying the torch, man. I mean, Bill, for, like, and dude, I said, yeah. I said, oh, that must be, I probably paid for that desk, right? <laughs> and that couch over there is probably mine, too, man. I probably paid for that. I know Vince paid for that back studio. Uh you know, it's like, well, oh, did you? God, I mean, God. I gotta believe that. I yeah. gotta believe that the that your crew with Marshall must have been going down to the the old Fantasy Studios in in Oakland. Like that's where the original one was. Well, then the one on Treat Street. Right. Well, then, then where the, we record. Oh Fantasy. my God! That was the garage. It was just a garage and a parking lot thing back there. I want to read you this. This is so. I I did this cosmic interview with a guy who. <laughs> Um, I mean, I, I got to reach out to him again because we, we have to do part two. But uh, it was Al Coster. Does that name ring a bell? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Tommy so Tommy's you. brother, right? And this guy was on fire and around, really right in your pot. And this is what he told me. He said, he said, Jerry Grinelli had a band called LSD, Light Sound Dimension. The band played behind the... Right. Now, this is the most legendary story. The band played behind the curtain with Flip Nunez, Noel Jukes, and those guys. They just played freeform sound, and it was very difficult to go in there and come out and say, quote, geez, I really enjoyed that. It wasn't pleasant music. <laughs> I had the same experience when I saw Train at Birdland in New York with Elvin, Jimmy, and McCoy. And that's the other issue is that so much, if I was younger cat seeing Grinelli and LSD, I'd want to walk out of there in a contemplative state. I'd want to walk out in agitation. That's the best meditation. It's not about being pacified or being played the hits so that they appease the audience. It's supposed to be uncomfortable. We've lost that because people are paying yeah. 80 bucks to go see something so the, the musicians feel obligated to please the audience. Nowhere in LSD was there about pleasing. I mean, you wanted the audience to... But the point is, you wanted him to walk out of there with newfound truth. You can riff any way you want on that. No, you just, in all honesty, we just want to walk, want him to walk in there so we can pay the rent. Right. But you yeah. know what I mean? No, sure. And to get the food stamp, which was absolutely but, much more. Re you could actually survive in San Francisco. Yeah. Designed, yeah, it wasn't designed to make you feel a specific thing. You, this music and this visuals. You know, you'd have one person who was in the Vietnam War reliving their Vietnamese ex war experience and another person who was so peaceful right? listening to this right. giant. I mean, there was sounds that hadn't been heard on the planet yet. And, you know, amplified timpani, for God's sake. Uh, well, and, dude, you were doing the cutting edge shit because you told me that, I mean, you know, I mean, you were at the Hate Street Flats and... Cats from the Grateful Dead, who they they were into what yeah. you were doing. I mean, you guys were. Ex explain exactly what, what, like, first of all, are there any? Is there? And I'm being serious, not so much the the demo from Berkeley, twenty minutes, but like this LSD stuff, pure, unadulterated, yeah. pulverizing, s vibrational love sound. Where I need to hear some of this stuff, and what, and you're telling me that like, there was no, and there was nothing that preceded there was one it. One serious recording. We spent five days with a man called Don Geis from. Uh, How do you spell his last name? G Y S E, famous engineer. He recorded all Vince's music. Wow. And he was at the Coast Recorders in San Francisco. Absolutely. But he came came to the theater, the LSD Theater on California Street, and we spent five days. Me, Flip, Noel. Uh, Beverly, uh, and we just recorded tape after tape after tape. 
of completely spontaneous music. And then I don't know what happened to the tape. You know Joshi Marshall? I, I, well, are you, is it Fred's wife? Who is that? Fred's son. I don't know Joshi. him. No, I don't. Does he have the tape? He's in Berkeley. He must, Fred was, uh, you know, Fred, we recorded every moment that band ever, we recorded rehearsals and then we'd have to listen to the whole rehearsal and call out our bullshit. Oh God, it was like ther- well, beyond therapeutic. But I mean, <laughs> uh, if anybody can find this, it's, it's, uh, it's on, you know, like four track, little four track. And, uh, well, we got, I mean, we it, got, are you, I mean, we have to find it, man. This is so beyond, this is so, so you're telling me, it was just, it was never released in any capacity, but it was, it was put down on tape. It was put down on tape. And by the time we got around to looking for it, nobody could seem to find it. I always felt like Fred had it. And he just wasn't copping to it. Right. And, uh, Beverly might know. Joshi might know. I've asked Joshi about it. But he would have any recordings. I have one um, half, you know, like a little reel to reel here that I've got to get moved Jerry, over Jerry, Jerry, I mean, dude, I, let's me, let's figure out, let's, let's make it a project and get this thing out to the, to, and so we need to get it out there, man. This is, because I mean, I, I've interviewed. This is an early what, what year do you think it was? 64, 65? Oh, let's see. We had left Vince, yeah. So, and this was at Peter Volkus's uh, uh, foundry on the railroad tracks on Berkeley, and it's it's uh, me and Fred, Noel, and Flip. Okay, wait. I just want to be clear. I don't want to. I don't want to get things confused. I thought you said Coast Recorders. Well, that was Coast. That's that's where Don Geis was, but we had this. The chronology is we. We played on California Street with Bill Ham Studio, and yep. that's where everybody came. We played at Bill Graham's Club, The Matrix, yep. me and Fred and Noel, and that's where The Dead would come and Pink Floyd, and then and then we you know did the Museum of Art. Uh, we thought we'd have these big breaks, but they never worked. And then um, then we got this. We made our own theater. R. Crumb and those guys gave us all their the prints from their, their from uh, the, the uh, magazines. And no so we had way! A gallery the- no way! Yeah. And so where? What was the address in the name? What was the name of the club? Was it the Bohemian Grinelli Club? What was it called? No, it was called Light Sound Dimension Theater on California Street. This is so ridiculous. Four oh blocks. So, so, so. It's the French movie theater now, <laughs> and we. Honestly, God, a bunch of dope dealers gave us the money. We painted the walls black, put brand new hardwood floors, put in a 40-foot rear projection screen that we were able to buy um, through the kindness of all these um, patrons in this dope business and built built this backstage area. So we did play from backstage. You came in, there was a quadraphonic system. You lie down on rugs and pillows, and then the lights would, it would just go completely black, and then an hour later we'd finish the piece. Dude, I mean that's what Al Col- that's what Al Coster was talking about. You were doing yeah. You were the first cats to be doing what I would call in modern times is called sound baths. Now that's what they're called. Yeah. I mean, but they were like yeah. they were like incredibly avant garde, which is so hip. Yeah, nobody else was doing it. Whatever they claim, Pink Floyd didn't think that shit up. Uh, nobody else was doing it. Let me ask you. Okay, I'm going to ask you about it. I'm going to ask you this because the spirits are at work, Grinelli. Because I, I want to. I know that you were the first. <clears throat> this is from the late great Steve Mitchell. <clears throat> he said, <clears throat> "When I got to San Francisco, I was playing with the Skyliners. We were doing Temptations covers, <laughs> and we we're doing Skyliners hits. <clears throat> if we don't have you, pennies from heaven." And he goes, then I started hanging out 
with the music circus, Raphael Garrett and Gerald Oshito, Oliver Johnson. Now, where did those guys fit in? Yeah. Those guys, uh, Raphael and Oliver, would study with me, and then Gerald, just, they were out. They were doing the uh, an acoustic version of playing free after. Raphael came after us. Okay, he, they, so you were, they actually learned, they, uh, you, you taught lessons, or you, you taught them, but th- their stuff. Yeah, Oliver yeah. was hanging around, young drummer around Bob City, incredibly talented, amazing drummer. Yeah, dude, I, he died, Raphael did he die young or something? Player. He died, I think, right? Yeah, he died way too young. Yeah, way too, and, amazing. Uh, Raphael was like a bass player, like Fred, you know, kind of straight, but weird. <laughs> kept getting weirder. <laughs> But they were, they were like, they liked doing things that we didn't like doing, like going to the park and giving out a thousand flutes, you know, and then playing with a thousand people. Yeah, that is, that sounds like a so, cacophony of, that could be bordering on noise, I think. Yeah, it was fun for a few minutes. Yeah, right. But then, then we did this thing that we called Sound Circus, which was putting LSD together with them because Gerald played like 20, all, every saxophone. He played every saxophone the saxophone band. And Oliver had his thing, and, you know. So we did this thing at the theater one night, one night concert. Ralph Gleason came. Oh, my God. And so it took, like, it took two hours to play one piece, you know, with all these people. And... Uh, Ralph said, why don't you, I'll write, a, this is amazing, I'll write a beautiful column that will come out tomorrow, and you run it for the rest of the week. You guys stay here and play for the next, and we'll pack this place. Oh I'll my. plug this thing. That's what I'm talking about. You just, there it is. There it is. That is America. Yeah. That, that's, Ralph, the, that's the American dream at work. That is right there. Yeah. That's it. I said, Ralph, nobody's going to come, man. They hate this shit. He's like, no, I'll, I'll, you'll see what I write tomorrow, that this is it. This is it. Wow. You want to hear American music? Now this is Oh, it. my God. And it was really great. Nobody came. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, that's, but you know what, you're, you're telling me that literally got written up in the San Francisco Chronicle by the leading music journalist of that time. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't really, yeah, ma- I mean, at the end, again, I just want to be clear, like, let's, can we, narrow in i mean you're you're thinking 65 i mean this is way before yeah. six the summer well, this is 65 66 some in there maybe by 68 by then really you know, where we're at really at so at, you know you, this was during or after maybe after the summer of love even oh yeah it had all been we'd all gone through all that okay we okay were, so it was post 67 that's interesting 68 we were already old. Yeah, you were altered, right? You yeah. were altered, yeah. So we were older. We were more artistically, you know, like settled and been around and working on as artists more than hippies. And so, you know, like Peter Volkus era, those kinds of artists, we were all part of that. But by the time we got to the theater, we decided this was our last try to have a home, you know, because we just couldn't, there was no work anymore um, to have a home. And so we kept it for like a year and a half. We kept it together and people came. We opened, we played every weekend. We played five nights a week. And whether anybody came or not, but people came. Let me ask you, Uh, can you just talk about like when, when you were in that group, um, like, were you playing off the first sound somebody made? Can, can you talk about the LSD, the magic of that group, the idea of, like, spontaneous improvisation? You weren't playing the American Songbook. No, no, no. Um, you just, it was all sound, so it just started. You know? I mean, sometimes it started because it might take a long time before there was any sound. Wow. But the idea, this, this idea of, of like going to the place of being able to listen and listen for what was going, listen what needed to be played. You just knew when you're listening that way, 
you're not listening with self-interest, right? Right. You know what to play. It's like a conversation. And it's like you, if, you're, if you're listening to the person and you're listening to the conversation without self-interest and bias, you know what to say. You just know. You can't, you know, it's not, I'm not going to say this and this will be clever. So it, it comes from that. And sometimes it's just you just bash into some shit. And that's how it starts, you know. You just reach for something and drop something and that's it. You're off and running. Mm. So it's got to be that, at one level it has to be that pure. On another level it has to be just somebody do something, you know what I mean, <laughs> to get us started and we'll deal. So I mean, it's, it's, yeah. It's, it's, so that was just became, because we kept, what I want to stress is that if you keep working on that form, it ceases to be the guy walking up to home plate and hitting a home run once. Anybody can do that. Any idiot can do that, right? Right. You can walk up in the major beat, guy pitches you a pitch, you whack it out of the park. But the guy who's trying to do it the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and the next day, that becomes his art form, right? So it's the same thing with this, I think. It's, it's like, you know, we get finished this concert in Vancouver, and I said to Priester, I said, hey, man, that was beautiful, Julian. And he said, oh, man, I, just, I played all that before. I don't want to hear that. Wow. <laughs> I mean, he goes to the nth like, extreme. The guy, that dude is such a, I mean... Uh, we just uh, his yeah. He's uh, I heard that already. Why would I want to? You know, <laughs> somebody else would kill themselves to play what he just played, and he's like, "Yeah, man." And he was right. You know, I thought about yeah. I'd heard him play that too, but it was so beautiful. I didn't even care. The music works, but he wasn't that yippy. You know. And, you know we uh, have a. Uh, Jer- yeah, go ahead. I think there's a. I think there's a understanding that that's. If you got the guts, as those guys used to say, oh, yeah, man, that sounds good, but are you willing to sleep in an alley? Yeah. You know? right, if, you right. got the, if you got through that fear and to, to get to that point with yourself, working with yourself, uh, uh, working with your own mind, working with this music, there's a, it's a great, um, I mean, certainly it's an amazing, wonderful journey to be allowed to be on in this lifetime and um you can do it people can do it you know you can people have you know and that there's just not many people who are interested in it right now i think and it doesn't matter and i don't even care if it's going to be cyclic i have to do this anyway because it's good work what you do what i do what a lot of people that i know do is good work exactly End of story. It has to be done. Whether it ter- changes the world, the world comes around, it gets better, it gets worse, doesn't matter. Yeah, the question, re- the question really is, are you, are, how are you affecting positive change in your world? Forget about the macro stuff. It's like, I mean, you, you can inspire cats in your world to be themselves, then you're doing your job with your work. I mean, that's the way I look at it, you know? Sure, you're doing, you know? You're doing your own you're doing your work if you don't you don't you know chop down a tree you're doing your work if you're <laughs> be, just being an artist is such a revolutionary thing at this point I completely, so say, I completely yeah. agree yeah yeah you know I don't need to be a political I am a li- hopefully I'm a living political statement my whole life you know and just having been through this whole hospital thing and been dead and everything it don't add up, you know, according to the rules. Right, uh, right. That's interesting to hear so that. It just, you lying there and you go, shit, I didn't really do, <laughs> I didn't really follow the plan. Um, you know, I'm alive right now because this young surgeon decided that he wanted, he was just so curious about what was killing me uh, and didn't believe what they said. I mean, went in there and fixed this thing. But Wow. Um Wow. Yeah. I'm alive because this this person here cares about me. I'm alive because this person happens to know I'm Jerry Grinelli. 
and has been to all my concerts. How's that? Wow. You know, I'm literally alive because this person has loved the music. You know, and they're willing to, this nurse is willing to go out of her way to save me. That's really bizarre and embarrassing. Well, I mean, but that also speaks about, like, you know, life happens when you're making whatever that line is. It's like you can't – I mean, first of all, it's I'm, yeah. so, I'm so happy that, you know, I mean, it's not – the universe has clearly said it's not your time yet, and you still have a lot of time to – you have time to create. Um, I just I, – I mean, the idea that you could be putting yourself out there naked to the world in your in an artistic fashion – for so many years and then have a surgeon who comes along who's, you know, who's, you know, been healed from your music and decides to go in and do some unconventional procedure that is not by the book in order to bring you back to life. That kind of speaks to your musical statements in some ways. So it, 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 yeah, that's the it, way it works. We have a game on this program called uh, Name That Voice. I want you to listen to this and pay attention to the content, and then we'll come back and break it down. I flunked it. I flunked it last time. You're gonna. I, you might. I think you might get this one, but it, I'm more interested in pay attention to, to what he's talking about, and then we'll come back. Okay. And then, there, I, I would read in books about how Kenny Clark was the first drummer to quit playing four on the floor and to use it as like he would his left hand to play non-repetitive comping figures. And I say, okay, I'm going to check that out. I could, I could never really figure out what he was doing until I met Ed Thigpen, oh. who was a gr- great, great jazz drummer. And Ed, um, Ed and I became good friends. I'm and very, very honored by that. And he had seen Kenny Clark live. And, I, I, and one day we were talking, and he said, just, I don't know how it came up. He says, you know one thing that really, really makes me angry? I said, what's that? He says, these guys who write these jazz history books and come out with these ridiculous statements. And he says, the one that kills me is that Kenny Clark revolutionized jazz drumming because he quit playing the bass drum on all four beats. And, and Ed said, that is absolutely false. He said, he played soft four on the floor and accented within that. Same way Max Roach did. Same right. way Blakey did. So there was a great misconception yeah. that all of a sudden everybody thought, oh, wow, man, everybody's done with four on the floor. I've got some recordings of Tony Williams with Miles. Where if, you ba- if you've got a good amplifier and can, and can switch channels on it, you can hear him playing soft four on the bass drum. I've heard Elvin play soft four on the bass drum. So, I mean, that is the kind of BS that, has, that distracts people from, from really listening to and thinking deeply about the music it's a stereotypical judgment which has absolutely no background or basis historically mr grinnell you want to take a guess at who that is no i have no idea who that is. a little bit younger than little wow. bit younger cat than you but but not by much uh ed Sof. you know Sof. oh yeah, 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 yeah. and and i just i, I oh, had wow. i had such a great t- it, you know, he, 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 he's so good at articulating these things. And I was, you know, you, you, you talk enough, to, you know, you talk to people who, who played with Kluke and he didn't have, you know, they'd say he didn't, he wasn't like, like, again, you talk about younger cats today being more technically per- perfect than you guys were, but that doesn't make the music feel any better. And here you have, um, Kluke didn't have like, he wasn't from the riffology school. He didn't have the quickest chops, but he used a lot of rebound and a lot of accent. But in my mind, as a younger cat, 43 Gen Xer, all you hear is he redefined drumming. He stopped playing four on the floor. Soph's telling me, no, he was just feathering. So I I just wanted you to talk a little yeah. bit about the – it's a, it's an art form. It's not gone. It's a lost art form because music sonically has gotten so much louder because – rock music and house music and, and heavy metal and rap, that's become popular music. What, can you just talk about how important feathering is to the idea of a conversation 
musically and, and ultimately how you became comfortable feathering the bass drum? Well, I played, I mean, quote, quote, I learned to play, you know, in the 40s. So it was boom, 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 boom. Because you couldn't hear the bass. So it was supportive. And then it never quite, yeah, it was all right. But when I, early on when I did hear bebop, see that straight, if you notice, what really changed it was not, not Kenny, but was the harmony. Right. Up to that point. You weren't dealing with two five ones. You weren't dealing with chord changes changing every two beats, right? So four doesn't work as well. And with Max and, and Buddy, um, Charlie Parker, you know, uh, you hear that. You hear that quality of Max always sounds a little stiffer than Kenny, right? Mm-hmm. Because Kenny's playing more. The way he was playing, he just used the bass drum as another voice. Right. But your foot's on that damn pedal, you know. Mm. And yeah, my foot's on that pedal, and sometimes it's feathering. It's going on all four. I just see it as another voice in the drum. In the in the, uh, I have four limbs, so it's another limb, and I'm using it in combination. What works harmonically and melodically. But if you go all the way back to Baby Dodds, you hear him doing that. With, even while playing boom, 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 you know, on that bass drum. Wow. Those drums didn't have anything. You listen to Baby Dodds, you hear him uh, playing like... Um, He's just playing that melody on the snare drum, you know, and the bass drum and the little high cowbell. He's just playing melodically, completely melodically. And I was just like blown away. I was like, oh, shit. I thought I thought this up, you know, only about 100 years too late. Uh, so, you, yeah, I, that's what's so great about what Ed's talking about is We've just begun to understand the science that went into these geniuses working with this stuff. You know, uh, yeah, and Kenny Clark, you know, then he had Charlie Parker and he had Bud Powell and he had this music that where this could go forward. Elvin changed John Coltrane's music. Without Without Elvin Jones, John Coltrane would have been having drummers put bar lines in his way. Hmm. Yeah, that's right. You know? uh, yeah, I mean, I think McCoy also was very cagey in, in, in his role, too, when I listened to that. Yeah, but that all, as a drummer pride, man, I'm, that all comes off of Elvis. Sure, no, absolutely. I heard it before and after, and Elvin allowed him to breathe. Elvin allowed Train to play the phrases he was hearing rather than putting bar lines. Because Elvin didn't think in bar lines, right? He felt them, but he didn't think in them. Oh wow! Tony, wow. Big Tony changed Miles' music. He gave him the space. Tony gave the whole space to that band. They could just rely on this burning energy of, you know. So there's times when the, the music changes, you know, the drums actually changed the future of the music by freeing up the horn players, freeing up the, you know, the melodic players. So, and plus Tony understood the harmony and melody. So it just kept changing, you know, and uh, it's wonderful to be able to think about things like that. Yeah, if you listen to it, you can subtly hear his foots on the floor, floor on the floor. And it's an art form to play fl- you know, with four beats on the floor. And then, but if you're playing with an acoustic bass in a trio, for myself, I decided every time I played a bass drum beat, I took out a bass note. Hmm. That's a bass note you don't get to hear. So I had to learn, I switched it over to my left foot. I said, I can play all those accents. I was playing with my right foot, playing with my left foot in the hi-hat, and you can still hear the bass. You know? 
so that's what kind of changed the trio play. Are there other are there other um, myths out there? Like I, I I something you just the arc of history for you is greater just because you've been on this planet creating for a lot longer than I than me. Are there other canards uh, along those lines? Like the Kluke thing is a major issue because I can't tell you how many people have written about him redefining. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, what else is? I mean, what are the? Is there another myth that Grinelli can dispel from the? You know, because the, the unfortunately the thick pens and the, the those cats aren't around to tell you the truth anymore. Yeah, it's just that. You know, you study somebody. You study. You can either just go steal their shit, right? right? Or you could study why, what. Like, if you studied Philly Joe Jones, or you studied that, we began to realize they weren't thinking about inter- independence. You know, like keeping your right hand straight and doing something against it. They were seeing it as a total pattern. Hmm. But that took a minute to realize, and it took a minute to realize that it was all based on this ability to internalize and understand the form. So you began to realize that the cardinal rule is to never get lost. If you're lost, you don't know where the form is, then you're in trouble. Then you then you can't play. But so. It's like if you look at it, you have to see that there was the history of the music. The greatest drummers were the most musical in the sense that they always understood the music they were playing melodically, harmonically, and then rhythmically knew how to move that music. Hmm. They can make a big band comfortable. You know, how to... It's just a science, man. It's It's fascinating. I could spend hours... Well, no, I want to, this is, I, I'm really glad, I'm, he's definitely, I mean, I got to get, I'm going to send you his number, you got to call him, because it was so beautiful to connect with him, it was Al Coster, he said, I was studying with Jerry, oh, yeah. I was studying with Jerry Grinelli for years, he was my main inspiration, yeah. my main inspiration, he always used to say, mm-hmm. everybody out there is playing on two and four, you hear it everywhere you go. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. you know, it's like, I mean, even then, oh. even then, no technology or nothing even close to, no mechanization. Uh, and there was still a formula trip going on. You had to play on two and four. You had, to, you know, and it's, there was all this. I just, I, I you know, Jerry, I, I, I couldn't ask a better person, you know, sitting in your chair and if there's, a cat who's going to listen to this 50 years from now and they are inundated with, again, media, we're, we're saturated with content. A lot of it is visual, very different from the listening mediums, you know, that you talked about learning the tunes, going to Bop City, mm-hmm. sort of an auditory, auditory kind of olfactory sense. Um, you know, mm-hmm. if in order to hear the collective conversation, in order to hear what Ornette heard, Dizzy heard. Now, I realize these guys were beyond genius, okay? But, you know, I mean, in order to hear the collective and not what you're not comping something, going back to the Gary Bartz thing, what would be your advice yeah, to yeah. younger? What are the things? I mean, cut your cut your cable, stop visual, looking at stuff visually. What yeah. can cats do to be able to, for their ears to grow so that they can develop their own hearing? Stop the input. Just at one point, I stopped buying records, and and um, Fred, which is great, somebody said to him, "Oh man, did you hear the new Miles record?" Fred said, "I didn't buy it, man." <laughs> the guy's like, "Are you crazy?" He said, "Well, Miles, Miles didn't go out and buy my record." <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yeah, because he. You know, then the guy should have said, "Because it was a twenty-minute demo, did <laughs> one song." Yeah, yeah, I know, but I mean, <laughs> yeah, the idea of you go. You got to have the courage to some point go. I'm going to stop the input, right? And I'm going to listen to what I'm playing. And I began to ask the question. Well, it's not comfortable with me. I don't like playing the hi hat on two and four. 
and it's not comfortable for me, so where is it? And then I began to listen again. I listened to go back and listen to the old man, Papa Joe Jones. Yep. Man, he does not play the hi-hat on two and four all the time. And I got to see him play, and he used the hi-hat in another voice. And that was kind of like my permission, you know. And so I used to pretend it was broke. John Hendricks would go and go, because he wanted me to play it on two and four, and he'd go, is your hi-hat broke? And I'd go, no, John, I'm just not playing. Just like last. <laughs> Rest in peace, Andrew. So the, so the singer sort of relies on that consistency, but yet it doesn't feel physically comfortable. Disney wanted it on, Disney wanted it on two and four. Mm. You know, those guys wanted that thing because it's a nice marker, you know, but they didn't. But I, it was not comfortable, you know, and even our Blakey man, he played it on two and four, but sometimes he'd get so far ahead it would become one and three, mm. uh, you know. And But it was it was just like, okay, we don't have to do that. I can play it on two and four if it feels like it, but I don't have to. I've got, man, it'll splash. It'll make beautiful colors. It'll make great accents. So, but if I was kept listening, I would have felt like obligated. And so, you have to stop listening for the for the input, right? And start listening to what you're doing. Take your take one symbol. Go sit in a room with one symbol and play it. That's all you got, man. Every nothing, nothing else showed up to the gig. Play one symbol. The next day, do that with one tom tom. The great science question is, what if? What if I only had this snare drum? Wow, man, I got a banjo far out. If I turn it over and strum the snares, if I'm crazy enough to spend six hours playing one snare drum, I will know what that drum sounds like. And then if I put it with that one tom tom, and if I put it with that one cymbal, whoa, what a sound power. I don't have to go ding, ding, ka ding, right? Right. I can play a, a cymbal line that matches the bass line and flows perfectly. And I remember one day, rest in peace, Peacock and I were playing. Oh. We were rehearsing with Ralph Turner, and we're playing. With, with who? With who? With who? Towner. Oh, Ralph Towner, yeah. Gary yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Ralph's playing piano, and he's... And me and Gary are playing time. You know, I've just got a snare drum and a cymbal. And we're just playing like swinging, you know? Sure. And suddenly it feels so good to both of us. And we're just laughing. He and I are just laughing hysterically because it feels so good. You know, like, and he's leaning on a beat for a while, getting ahead of the time, and I'm not, and then I'm laying back. We're just fucking with this beautiful thing because we're so inside of it. And, we're just laughing. It was so joyful, you know, to, to to be in this place, to be in this world, this groove world where it's so simple. And the symbol and the bass line are flowing as one thing, you know, yet independent. So it's, it's really like... Do you think, though, I mean, okay, I want to ask you, as a drummer, I mean, to, to, to cut the inputs, start listening to what you're playing, um, in isolation, that could lead to a lot of what we call wanking, you know? I mean, what? how important is it to going, to, how important, when do you think it's important for a seeker who's looking to hear the, to, to hear what, to, to develop their own hearing to actually engage, obviously it's not Grinelli and Peacock, but to engage with other cats to hear the collective sound. Sure. You have to find a community. You have no. to find some artists who are interested in that. I was lucky. I found some artists who right. were interested in that, encouraged that, um, you know, like encouraged me to do that shit. Um, and and built music around me doing that. And, um, but you have to find like-minded people, you know, people who want to do that, play that way. Um, 
but you also have to spend some individual time. My students always laugh, you know, and I say, yeah, well, I spent a lot of time just putting symbols on top of my head and hitting them, you know, <laughs> and just listening to, listening to the fact that nobody else heard these, got to ever hear the slow end of the symbol. All right? No, but you put a symbol on your head, just tap it, man, and the low end you never get to hear. So when I was in a recording studio, I said to the engineer, hey, man, record the cymbals from above, but also record the drums from below. Wow. Different sound. So I took it and made some money, you know what I mean? But I mean, it's <laughs> like understanding that. It's like, so, yeah, that's the sound of my cymbals is underneath. You're missing all that. Overheads are not getting that now, you know? So but that came from doing that. So you then have to be... Try to nurture a community. Try to find people who you... Um, I think this is part of the work we're talking about here, doing your work. You know, uh, right. I've been able to do it here in Halifax or wherever else I teach, but here it's very years, and there's a community of young people now who think this way, work this way together, and they play in rhythm and blues bands. They make records. But they come with this approach of to the instrument, you know, and they love to play free or quote free, but they love to play out. Yep, I love it. But, you I know, love they, it. They get hired to do pop music because there's some spirit in them that a pop singer just dies for, you know, uh, and so you have to build community. I think that's the major thing we can do now as among young people to build communities. Um, Let me ask you, Jerry. I'm gonna. Pro- I want to. I want to just push back for uh, not not really push back, but I I need to ask you. Not that there's an answer to it, but um, you know when, you know I've interviewed Jan Hammer, Perla, Dick Burke. Yeah. Uh, Ernie Watts. Now they were there at the Schillinger House. When, that was the first year Berkeley was open, and uh, yeah. it was a one school, one house, one room schoolhouse on Boylston Street. And guys like Charlie Mariano, again, this is the important yeah. part. Already established professional cat. Okay, already professional musician would go to the get off the road because the road was eating him alive. He was trying to clean up or he'd go to Berkeley to learn a new instrument. And then he'd get back on the road as a working professional musician. And now you have a system set up today with the Academy, which, you know, I mean, there's some good parts to it. Uh, Although I will say it's very constricting in my mind because it does give a paycheck to a lot of people. But the point is kids are going into the Academy to learn a language that yeah. cannot be codified with no guarantee of any gig coming out. That, to me, is the missing... Uh, that That's the whole thing, is like, Mariano could go... It's like a trade school, you know? You brushed up, you cleaned up, yeah. and then you hit the road again, or whatever you mean, you know, but you were a working... Per- How do you get... I mean, is it... A pers- Charlie Purse of Rest in Peace told me, he's just like, man, I said, how are we going to increase musical vocabulary... And and really, what I meant by that was like turning musicians into a profession again. And he said, "I hate to say this, but it's going to require a complete collapse of civilization." Yeah, <laughs> you know. And I mean, all I'm saying is, Billy Childs yeah. was like, I mean, I, I I interviewed Billy in like a few months ago, and he's like, we're having the same kind of discussion, and he's talking very candidly about the constriction of, of the academy. I go home. And I transcribe because I'm doing my work as you're talking about. I transcribe what he said, and he and it starts to get traction online because he basically was he wasn't bashing Berkeley by any means, but he was talking about the limitations of it of the academy. And and he writes to me, he goes, you know, Jake, you know, people do this all the time. They they paraphrase, they take things out of context. You know, would you take it down? And I said, Billy, I said, you know, I, of course. I said, but I just wish you'd tell me the truth because. The truth is, you don't. This thing's getting traction online, and you're afraid there's going to be blowback from the institution that's paying your salary during COVID. 
So you're conflicted about actually yeah. talking about what me, you know, it's a, don't, don't, don't bite the hand that feeds you. I mean, I just feel like it's an existential crisis that's going to require a lot of character. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. And it, and, it, and it requires people to, um, you cannot, you know, I was, I've been very fortunate where I got to teach in university, Cornish, you know, yeah. just incredible faculty. Then in Berlin with David Friedman, with just school, oh my God. we were able to create. Exactly. You had, that's why I love talking to you, because you actually tasted what, what is a beautiful sanctuary of, of education, improvisation, and then singing for your supper. That just yeah. does not exist anymore. Yeah. You know? So you had to really sing for your supper. You know, the, the classical people would be like, oh, you can't teach this. And so we'd write it up so it looked like a classical <laughs> program fit their pedagogy. Because <laughs> we yeah. we're not dummies. No. So it's like, yeah, man, I'll dance for you, man. I just, it's cool. But right now, you know, and when I, and I realized but as soon as I left, and as soon as David left, and as soon as you leave these big places, they tilt back to the right. Right? And so as soon as they tilt back to the right, that's where they that's where they naturally want to be. So right now is we can't battle these things. Some of us have to be willing to start new things. Right. And it seems like a drop in the bucket. You know, I've got for me it's been creative music workshop. Here in Halifax, the middle of nowhere, on one level, and you can I can list off the names of the great musicians who come here to teach because they want to teach this way. Right, exactly. They can teach this way. Naropa Institute, you know, people would come and they'd go, it's the same deal as last year. I'd say, yeah, I'll give you a paycheck. You sign it back to me. And they'd say, okay. <laughs> we had no money. But they came. Because they, it was a freedom in teaching that they couldn't find anywhere else. I think that was true in the beginning of Berkeley. I remember talking to Gary. But now it's a factory. And it's an academy. And it's an assembly line. And it turns out a product. Yes. And it's an assembly line. And they say you're going to do this, but half after the first year, half of those people are gone. There's some cream that rises to the top. There's some teachers that are... If you can spend time with David Tronzo, God bless you, man. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Or great teachers there who are still willing to teach. But as a system, it's a 400-year-old system. It's still going to the king and asking for permission. You know? There's Til no tilting back to the right. But it's, the, the, it's, the, it's very, yeah. it's, it's, auto it's autocratic kind of stuff. Yes, it's like, can I do this? Yes. Master? Yes. You know? Yes. Can I make this music. Can I do this? That's not how art moved forward. Right. That's exactly. not how exactly. education exactly. moved forward. That does not produce genius. That does not allow genius to grow. You know, that doesn't ask the question. So it's time because things are as bad as they've ever going. I've ever seen them in this planet. Uh, -huh. It's time. You got nothing to lose, man. You know what I mean? Go for it. Find some young people who listen to you or be willing to try to teach this properly. And you can, but it's a gutsy move. That's all. And I've been so lucky up here because when I went first went to the board of directors here, I just said, I just said, I can guarantee you this will never make money. Okay. Hmm. And if you ask me every year why we're not making money, I can always tell you, I told you that the first time, you know. So now it does, you know, because I do some benefits. And that, but that's why you're doing like, it in Canada and not in the United States, because they would have shown you the door right away. Without it's, it's all about the money, you know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so these people went, "Oh my God, he's not. He's not. How much are you going to lose this year?" I said, "I told you up front." You know, and but the and what I just want to be clear right? for people that are going to listen to this though. But there's the offset of that is that the community gets built, built. The cats come in with huge a, a huge bag of they 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 have they have a, a lot, they have a big bag of tunes and they also can fill in sessions 
pop or blues sessions sure. and make it feel great because they have the ability to get all the way around their instrument. Basically, you're just building a music community, and it's not that is not about the bottom line. That's yeah, but that's. I mean, there are people who are practitioners, and there are people who are innovators. Maybe there are two different types of people. I can't demand that someone innovate if they're not comfortable. Mm. Maybe I was really born in <laughs> just innately impossible for me to be uh, a follower. You know, I just like can't deal, right? So, I, you know, it's hard. <laughs> yeah. Myself. Oh, absolutely. He has this, you know, he's this reggae thing he does. He goes, I go, how come you never hire me on these gigs? I said, I can play that music. And he goes, yeah, but then you get bored and you start fucking around. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you change shit, you know. And I'm like, oh, man, you know. Anyway, I think we have to stop here for a minute because I'm getting tired. But, I just, can, uh, I, can, I, can I read you one final thing just before you? Because I've been doing a lot of Grinelli work okay. in the last, since we did our last interview. And, uh, sure. This is from Landy. He said, uh, <clears throat> when I first started coming to Boulder, it was because there was a summer jazz session that happened every year starting in the late 1970s. Right. I was invited by Jerry Grinelli, who's an amazing drummer. We started combining the arts. When I started doing the Naropa Summers, I played with Allen Ginsberg. Every year he would rap yeah. with my band. We began to have real strong interactions with language, with movement, and Naropa invented contact improvisation, a beautiful form of dance. It wasn't particularly a performance form, but we did concerts with them all the time in the summer. The summers in Boulder were unbelievable. Sure. Peacock was here, Abercrombie, Priester. This went on and on for years, and it was all Grinelli's baby. No, I, I mean, to that to me is like, I, I mean, I, I got to get you these. You, this has got to be in a book, man. I mean, th 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 that, that, I mean, contact improvisation i mean it's i'm i know that there's i you know nancy stark smith what's that mm -hmm. nancy stark smith was one of the the major practitioner of that form she brought it to naropa and then we barbara dilly was in the dance department it was just it was just this it was all created an open space was created by joy m Trunk. Right, and, and you and you guys were saying, "God, I can't wait to see how they're going to layer this, layer on this in the '80s." And then nothing, and then it was just yeah, stopped. You know, my first year there, my first year there, my first concert was with Allen Ginsberg and what's her name, uh, Peter, all the poets. I did an evening of poets. Ferlin Getty, Ferlin Getty, and and Kerouac, and yeah, oh, all those guys. Oh my yeah, God! All those guys came. And I, that was my first concert. <laughs> that is, a, dude. Know, I, I mean, need Alan, the tapes of that, man. Allen Ginsberg, Naropa has. You should bug them because they have tapes of all these concerts. Are you kidding me? Every semester, every. No, I record. Made sure everything got court recorded. A band with Don Cherry, Art Landy, me, uh, Abercrombie. Oh, my God. Another one with most of Oregon plus somebody, Peacock or Peacock and Glenn Moore. Yeah. Uh, Treaster, Jay Clayton. Uh, yeah, all these people. But Naropa has this whole archive. Me and Ginsburg. Um, me and Ginsburg played... You know, once a, once a week or something, and he'd say, "Oh man, you're playing so loud sometimes." I said, "That's because I can't stand the way you sing." <laughs> you <know? laughs> Wait, hold on. Was he doing was he doing kirtan chanting, or was he or like he was just riffing poetry, and you were uh, oh. riffing poetry and trying to sing the blues? Oh yeah, that, dude, I'm, again, dude, Grinelli, I got to get that archive. Okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go seek that out, man. I uh, that is. I'm just saying. Oh, there's yeah. there's a lot of. Uh, you know, man, I, I, this is a sacred journey for those me. Are, yeah. oh, it is, but we're, those are just our job. Those are just our seeds. You plant those, and some part is kind of selfish because you're having so much fun. Right. Uh, to see how far you can push it. You know, like, hey, man, okay, we'll do a percussion class with 
four dancers and drums. Okay. We'll do a class for just poets and drummers, you know, and I say, okay, here we go again, you know, uh, <laughs> but so open. And I think that the multidisciplinary form, which is, we're starting to see more of it. I just can't imagine why anybody doesn't want to work with that work. You know, well, no, but that goes back to the, so, it goes back to this. We can, we can end this session with this is that, Everyone today in the, you know, just going, taking the studio model of making a record. Again, I know you didn't dwell on the L.A. studio scenes, but Rusty Young from Poco, uh, rest in peace. You know, yeah. he was, I mean, the guy was like plugging in a Leslie speaker to his pedal steel, playing like yeah. getting a Jimmy Smith sound on his. He was going in and making and serving the song. And at a certain point, the efficiency model came in. And he realized that he was being called. He stopped doing session work because he wasn't there to play or to serve the song. He was just there to fill a sonic space and play it safe. Right. And if you were made a mistake, right. it was like public shaming. So, you know, the, the multi uh, entertainment stuff is great, but it's always going to cater to playing it safe. The avant garde stuff is so scary to the right, things that have tilted so far to the right. That that stuff is, people would look and say, we can't monetize this. We have to just do what's going to create the bottom line, put butts in the seats. I don't care if people are even paying attention. They're clapping after the song and they don't even like the song. That's part of the issue. I mean, it's just, it's, we have been trained. Yeah, okay. it's, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's more complicated, but. It, it actually isn't. It's just it's about playing it safe. That's all it is. And as long and we're going to get warmed over crap, you know. In that case, what we're getting, what we're getting, yep. uh, we're getting it from the trees and the planet. And That's right. No, the, the the, yeah. I mean, Densmore Densmore said it best to me a couple months ago. He goes, you know, this is basically Grandmother Earth. This pandemic saying you guys, oh, yeah. you, you guys have taken it too far, and we're just going to chop a big toe off right yeah. now. You know, don't mess with Mother Earth because she'll go and kick your ass yeah, sooner or right. later. Hey, you before know, yeah. this is just, uh, yeah. I think this is these are you just plant these seeds and the, and we go forward and you find some people who listen and um yeah it's just it's and you don't know if it's going to pay off and you're not in it for the pay. No, off. no, no. Well, this yeah, th this is yeah, the, the hope is that the hope is that when we've left this planet, that, that, that those seeds will, I mean, my show has been going on 10 years and the bush now is starting to get hardy for the first time after 10 years. I mean, yeah. it's finally really sure. getting flush in the sense of different avenues to support the livelihood but yeah this started with a seed and it's finally like the roots are so strong it's finally growing but it takes a long time i mean that's jerry i know you're i know i mean that's we've just been just cooking for 80 like, minutes here i mean i i don't want to i don't want to uh we can always do it again but i'm just tired no man I, you know what one thing i wanted to ask you and we, you can just let me know but I, I would love could you connect me with robin ford for an interview Sure, I send you his phone number. Thank you, bro. And I'll tell him. I'll yeah, no, no. Let, call him and be like, because you know, I mean, like, I mean, that he, I, I, he's, he's one of those cats. When I thought about what you were saying about somebody who comes to, who wants to teach that way, even though he may not be like the most avant-garde player, he he does incorporate that freedom and that essence in his playing. You know, I mean, he's just just like oh, that. You know, magnificent. He's magnificent. He's magnificent. And you want to, he's just magnificent. Yeah. And, um, he's one of the cats. So yeah, I, yeah, I, one of, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's just magnificent. And yeah. And he just, you know, they come and they want to ask him how to do this. And he just doesn't, he just goes on and doesn't teach him uh, <laughs> that. But he, he, he is, he is really, I was thinking earlier when we were talking that we, that, you should talk to Robin. Yeah, no, it's long overdue. Man. Yeah, so just yeah, let's hook that up and let's do okay. this again, man. It's uh, you know, I'll tell you, the spirits came to me and said, I just sort of read a little bit about the stuff you put up regarding your your hospital visits, and I just said, I just want to get to Jerry at least a couple more times because the guy is just 
You know, like you said, I mean, it's just about planting seeds. That's it. We just want to plant as many seeds and let them germinate. You know, th- that's the problem now. We we plant a seed, then we plant another seed. We don't even let them germinate. We just move on. Can't do that. You got to move on. So they're germinating on their own. and Some of them are really are. But some, but a lot like, of it the, needs cultivate. A lot of them need cultivation. We don't live in a time that allows for that. That's a whole other issue. So anyway, Grinelli. No, you got to go back. Yeah. That's why I want to live longer. You will. Uh, and continue. Listen, man, I, okay, all I want to, I hope you, I hope. I will put you in touch with you. Yeah. I'll put you in touch with Rob. I'll also send you Joshi's email address. Yes. And you can, you can just. It'd be great to have. Dude, we need to get that out. The flip and Marshall. I mean, let's get it out. Anyway, much much love to you, Grinelli. Seriously, man. Great hang, dude. Love you, too. All right, man. Peace out. Yeah. Bye. 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 You have $9.78 remaining in your account. Only to. Well. It is such a treat to reconnect with a, an incredible drummer and an articulator of different types of ways to move forward artistically to inspire regular people and hopefully um, drive consciousness toward a better world. Jerry Grinelli, thank you so much, brother. That's it for the Jake Feinberg Show. We will see you tomorrow.